That's a fascinating turn of, of phrase. They have very little agency over their beliefs. Say more about that. Agency over your beliefs means that, first of all, you need to understand epistemology, which is this uh, uh, word that philosophers use when they discuss what you can know and what criteria for truth are. And if we take, for example, uh, something like, say, the lab leak hypothesis is a good example for epistemology. So uh, the epistemology means, in my view, uh, that the confidence that you should have about something being true should equal the weight of the evidence. But everything that is not impossible is possible. And you have to remain agnostic about all the things that are possible. But you have to uh, also adjust the confidence in that space. So not everything that is possible deserves the same degree of confidence. And that also means if somebody makes a claim and has no, no evidence to present for that claim, then you don't need necessarily to uh, have confidence in that claim. And if that other one cannot have evidence for that claim. So for instance, say, uh, was Jesus born by a virgin? Um, how would you know? Have you talked to her uh, gynecologist? Are there any reliable sources and so on? <laughs> Are there people uh, who could have had reliable sources on this? Or uh, was it always the case that there were people who were personally involved and might have had a vested interest for people to see it one way or the other for other reasons, right? So uh, there might be cultural reasons to adhere to a certain narrative, because if you have a, a non-random belief that not a normal, reasonable person would have, and you share this belief with your friends, maybe it marks you as one of your friends. So it becomes like a branding iron on your intellect by which everybody can recognize that you are one of the good ones because you believe in something that is on, on the face of things extremely unlikely. Right? Uh, this is uh, something that is epistemologically unsound. So violations of epistemology are often a mark that distinguishes people within a movement or an ideology or a religion. And um, it's um, desirable sometimes if people build a religion to put these marks on, on the minds of their members so you can recognize them, that they believe non-random, non-rational things. For the lab leak hypothesis, to, to take this as an example, um, initially when you see that a, a virus uh, breaks out, you know that a type of, of this virus has been broken out from labs in the past, there is a possibility that this happens. So it's not very hard to rule it out. And when you see that um, the virus uh, of the same type that is being researched on a lab emerges in a big city in very physically close proximity to that lab, that increases the possibility that this happens. And uh, if you uh, learn that the, the people in this lab worked on um, animals and uh, did variations, uh, studied variations of viruses and animals, especially bats, right, this suddenly increases the probability to such a degree that you uh, might think that, okay, out of all places in the world, the lab that uh, might be foremost in the world in studying this type of disease and was uh, built after the first SARS uh, breakout to uh, study exactly this kind of disease uh, is very close to where this happened. Now, this becomes the null hypothesis, right? It should be the null hypothesis unless you have an extremely good insight reason or good argument that you have reason to trust that speaks against that. And then uh, you uh, start seeing lots of interested people. So you see people which uh, want this to be uh, something that has been broken from a lab and was actually engineered possibly as a bioweapon to harm the world or to harm specifically the US or whatever, uh, see, uh, quickly goes into motivated reasoning. They're basically just because something fits into your preferred view of the world, of its agency, of its moral outlook, and so on, you think it should be this way or the other. Or you see the counter argument that people who have this particular bad view of the world uh, are the ones who are arguing for the possibility of a lab leak. Therefore, the lab leak cannot have happened, and it must have been a zoonotic, biological, random origin. Uh, that's as equally suspicious, right? As soon as you see players making arguments, based out of the attempt to sway public opinion one way or the other, because it fits into a certain narrative, um, you should be suspicious, right? So uh, you basically you should try to identify the uh, likely biases that people have and try to correct for those biases. And this means more, uh, be more open to dismiss arguments that might be uh, the result of such a bias and basically try to find the a subset of the opinions that is compatible 
with all the data and uh, focus your exploration on, on this set. You know, this is something that you uh, talked about in your my favorite talk that I've seen that you give is the computational metapsychology. Um, and you were talking about how it was evolutionarily um, advantageous, not necessarily to think the the correct thing, the right thing, but actually to think the normative thing. What is it that everybody else believes? Because to not believe what everybody else believes could make you an outcast in, in a tribal society or in an area where if you get pushed out of the group, you'd have to live completely on your own. It, it strikes me um, when I was reading Rene Girard about mimetic uh, desire, that his thoughts on um, the fact that like human beings don't know what to want. In fact, if you just put a human being out in the world, like a small child, it's, it's really not possible for them to want things other than maybe their biological needs. Do you take that, that normative belief to be this similar to, to Rene Girard's mimetic desire concept? I suspect that for us, the uh, thing that distinguishes us from other primates is our programmability. It's not that we are smarter than the Neanderthals, but that our society scales up in ways that the Neanderthal society didn't or that tribal societies didn't. And this uh, enables us to interact coherently with people that we never met. We basically identify strangers as having certain roles, as um, following a certain type of beliefs. And this allows us to interact consistently with, with them, even though we don't know them. And uh, it's a fascinating thing that you suddenly get a society that is almost infinitely scalable. It doesn't really matter once you have this type of organization, whether you have hundreds of thousands or millions of individuals, because you can suddenly interact with all of them according to a certain set of beliefs. And a tribe doesn't scale up in the same way. And I suspect that this, uh, these uh, changes that had had to happen had to do with us being more interested in understanding what other people believe to be true than what's actually true. And for our own life, it's more important generally to know what our boss thinks, what our peers thinks, what the relationships that we have think about the world and us than uh, about what's actually true. Because uh, what's actually true is something that is explored in a lab behind uh, closed doors at some kind of frontier that rarely affects what you're doing. And uh, the common beliefs are a good enough approximation for what's actually true. And it's it gets interesting when there is a deviation between the common beliefs and what's actually true. Yeah, particularly on things like, um, you know, a lab leak hypothesis or are vaccines safe or not, like as those start as you start deviating from there and then deviation causes real rifts in society to, to the degree that people believe they can't even live alongside one another anymore. Yes. And uh, this uh, issue is also one where, uh, that people are not just good at co cooperation. We are very good at deep cooperation, but people have also evolved for conflict between groups. And uh, we are not just a cooperative species. We are a species that is um, in competition with itself. And uh, this competition largely doesn't happen so much between individuals because this doesn't get you very far. We are a state building species. It happens between groups that want to be a state and wants to uh, have a shared harmonic belief at a very large scale. And uh, if you can create a rift between people in this way, uh, then you can split off your own state, state in a way. And that's also what we have seen happening on social media. Social media has been open so far for uh, to a very large degree it means that every set of ideas that wanted to evolve could and start to capture people capture the beliefs of people and uh, spread through them and it's very interesting to see uh, that once you create such an uh, opportunity for the emergence of say cults then cults will emerge and then they will of course become more agentic and will start shutting down the possibility for newcomers to uh, compete with them and so we now see a movement to shut down the freedom of social media for opinions that compete with the opinions that have emerged in social media are very novel right we have a set of very widely shared beliefs very strongly held beliefs that didn't exist 20 years ago and, and they never existed in human history ever despite people basically being about as smart as they are today at least right and uh, these, these beliefs are not cannot be questioned they, uh, and this is a very interesting thing when a belief cannot be questioned. For instance, if you see people with the art science, I believe in science, uh, they don't express that they believe in the possibility that everything can be systematically criticized. 
Right? <laughs> <laughs> it just means that uh, New England Protestantism has entered a new phase. <laughs> oh, that is fascinating. Uh, there's a guy named Zach Stein that refers to these as self-terminating cliches, right? They're, they're a form of ideology because the statement in and of itself is designed to make it so we don't continue the conversation anymore. Well, in this house, we believe in science or, you know, I, I, there was a large sign over the, the, um, our door coming into my house. This house believes in the Lord, right? Like those are self-terminating cliches. Yes. But let's not turn this into me intermediately into something normative. There is something good about this and there are drawbacks of this, right? So it's, uh, let's not start out with the attempt to say whether this is good or bad. It's very hard to build your own worldview from scratch and to be truthful in everything, right? In order to understand the world, you need to build on the knowledge of others. You need to build on intellectual and also ethical traditions because it's very hard to prove them from first principles as an individual as I have learned in the course of my life. <laughs> and it's in some sense, that's what I had to try to do because I grew up in communist Eastern Germany, which didn't make a lot of sense to me. And while I had uh, the news of Eastern Germany and the news of Western Germany every uh, evening on TV, uh, none of them appeared to be true. And you have to pick from them. You have to pick from uh, what your teachers are saying, from the books that you find in your library, are saying you have to identify what's true and it's very hard to get very far if you do this all by yourself so how do you find the truthful tradition and the other one is when you want to act you cannot act alone you need to act uh, together with others with whom you coordinate so how do you find the right group the right hive mind to link up to and to interact with and while it is in some sense disgusting to me if people are privileging the opinion of the group over their own insight about what's true and uh, it is also something that is very powerful, especially if you realize that you as an individual don't have a very good chance of discovering the ground truth and of, uh, of building a new group that is acting on this shared understanding of what the world, world really is. So this idea of that we believe in the Lord or that we believe in Jesus Christ means we believe in a certain mode of interaction, we believe in certain institutions that synchronize our beliefs, we believe in certain values that shape these groups and we believe in together with this group building a civilization because this is the group that our loyalty allies with and we don't see a better alternative realistically right and the, the same thing is true for the people who believe in science they basically believe in ivy league science they believe in priests that are harvard ordained and it's not necessarily a bad thing right it's not that easy to get that sacrament and uh, if you see look at the available sacraments it's not one of the worst ones <laughs> Ah! <laughs>